Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to uh, welcome you to this session. Uh, this is our first session that we're uh, kicking off as part of our Northern Dialogues event series. Uh, so we've been uh, working on this for a while, and I'm really excited to see it come together and for all of you to join us for this today. I'm just going to do a few quick remarks, and then I'm going to um, hand it over um, to these folks who have prepared an awesome, awesome session for us today. Um, I will quickly introduce myself. My name is Kyle Rich. I'm an associate professor at Brock University, um, and I'm working on the back end of this stuff. Um, I do also want to take a, a moment to recognize that I'm joining um, from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Throughout all of these sessions that we're doing, it's really important to kind of reflect on where we're joining from, um, what that land means and what it means for us to be taking up that space. Um, I recognize that we're all joining from many different places today. So I encourage you, um, if you're not familiar with the, the territory you're joining from, to um, look that up, learn a bit about it, and think about how um, what that means to you um, and what you can kind of learn from that um, throughout this process. Um, I will also encourage everyone uh, to check out our conference and or our program webpage. Um, I'll share that link in the chat there. We've got a series of events coming up. Um, we've got another webinar as part of this series that's going to talk about drawing on and building from research capacity in northern communities. We've got a, another a great set of speakers lined up for that one. And we have a big event happening in May, um, which will be um, a conference that's happening in Whitehorse. And there will be a, a virtual component to that. So even if you aren't able to join us in Whitehorse, I would encourage you to check that out. And if you're interested, maybe join us for some of that virtually as well. Um, so I will put that link in the chat. Feel free to check it out and check back um, to see that stuff as it keeps coming up. Um, a few other quick housekeeping things. We will be recording this um, so we can share it and then people can continue to share it and learn from it as we move forward. So just a, a note there. Um, and we will ask that if you have questions, you can put it in the Q&A. So we have a chat that's enabled and then we have a Q&A option as well. The Q&A will let us manage it and keep the list kind of neat. So if you have specific questions for panelists, please put your questions in the Q&A and uh, then we will keep that and we can relay that onto the panelists towards the end. And then you can continue to, to chat and in, uh, in the chat if you would like to there as well. Uh, so with that, um, I guess, and the one final thing is if you do have any trouble connecting, I know you probably won't because you're probably already with us now, uh, but Vivian's contact information is on the, the web page as well. She is our um, troubleshooting tech expert working on the back end. So if you have any trouble or you need anything or you have questions about the program at all, you can uh, reach out to Vivian and uh, she will help you out there. So with that, I'm very excited to hand it over um, to Kristen and Agnieszka, who are going to um, introduce our panelists and facilitate this session today. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. And uh, now over to you two. Thanks, Kyle. And thanks for inviting us to, to host this first webinar in the series today. We're really happy to be here. Um, so I'm Kristen Catherine Manta. I'm the Director of Living Heritage for Heritage Saskatchewan. And Heritage Saskatchewan's work traverses the traditional homelands of the Nahia, Nahitha, Nahina, Cree, Nakawe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Dene, the homeland of the Michif, Métis, which are territories covered under Treaties 2, Treaty 4, Treaty 5, Treaty 6, Treaty 8, and Treaty 10. We are committed to building relationships with Indigenous communities and learning to live on these lands in a better way. I'm coming to you today from Treaty 4 territory, specifically in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Agnieszka Pawolska Mainville, who is a professor, an associate professor in the Department of um, Global and International Studies. Got that right, Agnieszka, University of Northern British Columbia. And she and I share a UNESCO chair in Living Heritage and Sustainable Livelihoods. Um, and so, this chair, and I invite you to check out our website so you can get a lot more detail on it. I don't want to take too much time today on it. Um, but in this work together, we are examining or exploring how does living heritage or intangible cultural heritage, which Agnieszka will define for us all in a few minutes, how does that link with sustainable livelihoods? Um, and so we're really excited to be working together um, on a, a variety of different projects, including this webinar today. And we will also be presenting together at the White at the Whitehorse Conference, Kyle mentioned. Um, and I think that's an, all I want to say about us for now. I want to turn it over to our guests today, our speakers. So we have three people joining us today from different parts of the North. And we're going to talk a little bit today. What does 
what does Northern even really mean? Um, how does that play out in various contexts? Because this is part of, of course, the series on Northern dialogues um, and looking at what, um, what are, what are Northern communities doing to um, foster or sustain sustainable livelihoods? Um, and so we'll get into that once we get into the questions with our speakers. Just so you know, today is gonna be a sort of round table format. Um, our speakers will all have a few moments off the top to give us some context about themselves. Um, however, we're mostly gonna just be dialoguing. We're gonna be talking to each other with some of the guiding questions that Agnieszka and I prepared. So I'll introduce our speakers and then I'll turn it over to Agnieszka um, who will talk to us about um, intangible cultural heritage. And then the speakers will have a few moments to talk about their own context before we launch into some of those questions. So our first speaker today, or um, first alphabetically anyway, is Vincent Casey, who's a public education coordinator with the government of the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. Um, he's a grandson of Sir Patrick Millen and Lady Mary Millen of New Zealand and on his mother's side and Sir Maurice Casey and Dame Stella Casey on his father Liam's side. So he was born in New Zealand, came to Canada when he was young and grew up in Ottawa where he attended high school, graduated from Carleton University with a bachelor's of aerospace engineering and then continued on to the University of Ottawa for a bachelor degree of education. After a few years of teaching in Calgary and Guyana, he moved to the Northwest Territories in 2008 He's held jobs in the school system, the correctional system, and most recently with the Department of Environment and Climate Change with the Government of the Northwest Territories. And for those of you in the North, he's the son-in-law of Mo Miller, who was a teacher for many years in Yellowknife, and Dave Miller, who worked for many years on the CBC Morning Show. So welcome, Vincent. Thank you for being with us today. Also with us today is Robert Spence on his phone. And Robert is from Tatasquia Cree Nation in Manitoba. He is a hunter, a trapper, and a fisherman. He's also an advocate for land and water protection, and he advocates for his relatives, the Churchill River Sturgeon. He's um, involved in land-based learning and is also a self-taught artist, carver, welder, and a knowledge keeper. And also with us today is Renell Sylvester, um, who is an Honoring Her Spark and Cultural Humility Coordinator for the Lalash Friendship Center in Saskatchewan. Rochelle Sylvester is a proud member of the Clearwater River Dene Nation on Treaty 8 territory in the Northwest Saskatchewan and resides in the Métis settlement of Lalash. She holds a Bachelor of Education degree in Indi Indigenous Education from the University of Regina and First Nations University of Canada. And she teaches others how to revitalize Dene language through reading, speaking, and writing in her language. She's volunteered her time to various boards within the community over the years that she has lived in Lalash. Um, through Northern Light School Division, Sport, Recreation and Culture, Lalash Minor Sports, Lalash Preschool, the Friendship Center, and now with the School Community Council and Heritage Saskatchewan. She currently, as I mentioned, holds the role of honoring her spark and cultural humility coordinator with the Lalash Friendship Center. So I'll turn it over to Agnieszka now to give us some grounding in what we're talking about when we use these terms, living heritage and intangible cultural heritage, and then we'll turn it back to our guests. And thank you again for being here with us today. Thank you, Kristen, and thanks, Kyle, for having us as part of this conference. So I'm going to provide you with just a very brief um, example and definition of what intangible cultural heritage is and how we are going to use it for our discussion today. So first of all, intangible cultural heritage, sometimes used as the acronym ICH, has always existed for generations. So it's not something that's new. It's something actually that people hold it's um, sometimes considered to be living heritage, a cultural expression. It's sometimes uh, the term is used ethno-linguistic group, or some people just call it the way of life or the way we've always done things. Some people use the term traditional ecological knowledge, folklore, or of course in Canada, we also use certain um, French terms such as patrimoine vivant. However, the term or the concept of ICH really became institutionalized and formalized through the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization in 2003, when the organization actually made a convention relating to the protection and safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. So what ICH or intangible cultural heritage is, it's basically it refers to practices, representations, expressions, knowledges, and skills 
that communities, groups, and sometimes individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage. And it's also important to notice that it also entails languages and linguistic expressions and oral stories, which I'll provide examples in a second. But it also, of course, it includes things like tangible artifacts as well, so buildings and artifacts. However, it goes a little bit more um, just the kind of concrete things. It talks about traditions and um, living expressions that are passed down from generation to generation and sometimes going up the generations as well. So some examples of this, this thing that we call ICH or intangible cultural heritage are things like oral traditions. So the stories that we tell, that we pass down, for example, a creation story that can be passed down that we've heard from our grandparent and now we're sharing with um, a grandchild or a nephew or a niece, or even we're sharing it as part of a conference. Um, it could be a folk tale, a proverb, sometimes a riddle. It could be unique phrases or idioms, or even sometimes dialects as well that hold cultural significance. It could also be very performative. It could also be things like traditional dances performed during a festival or a celebration. And I'm going to provide a powwow here as um, an example that could be very obvious. It's something that is performed at a specific time. And it's usually something that has been taught by a family member that's older and is teaching further down the generations um, a, from one um, generation to another. But it could also be things such as puppet shows in some cultures or street performances that convey cultural stories. It could also be rituals or ceremonies associated with a particular festival. So um, ICH has um, this position at UNESCO where you can, uh, countries that have signed the convention can nominate um, some of their elements to kind of this, this list of cultural heritages of humanities and over a hundred and I think 181 countries, if I'm not mistaken, this year have signed on to this convention and includes things like the Christmas, Christmas um, night vigil event, for example, or the way that people pray in some ways, or it could be the way that people do mathematics in China on the um, using their special tools. But it could also be things like handicraft techniques, the way we make a specific craft. Mm -hmm. So pottery making that has been passed through families, boat making in some um, some ways. It could also be fishing or farming methods that require things. And of course, the last but not least, it could be things that we do in our everyday life. So like a folk music or songs that we, that we sing at special gatherings, the way we play, the way that it sounds and the words that are sang with it are part of that cultural heritage. And of course, culinary traditions. So the cooking methods, the foods and the recipes we have. So we really ICH is this combination of things that relate to who we are as people, what we value, why we do the things that we do. And unfortunately it is diminishing with time, which is one of the reasons that this convention was created in the first place is because globally people realize that elements of their cultural heritages are disappearing from migration sometimes from war or different policies or just commercialization and the change of time that's happening um, and people moving into the cities and um, changing um, their livelihoods, which is why um, our chairship really talks about sustainable livelihoods. How do we maintain a way of living perhaps that's inspired by our heritage that we can use and continue the traditions of the way we eat and how we cook, how we sing, what we share, what we talk about, how we even heal ourselves. So a lot of this richness and diversity of elements constitutes intangible cultural heritage of different nations, different groups, and they're all uh, equally valid and equally appropriate um, to share and safeguard and should have a place to last for generations. So given that this conference is located and discussed and based on this idea of remoteness and rural um, and northern communities. I wanted to link this idea of cultural heritage that's intangible with this idea of sustainable livelihoods and particularly in the context of remote and rural, uh, rural communities. So I will actually ask the question to our panelists now is how do you interpret this the, the terms rural, remote, or even um, northern um, northern communities given that we are in so many ways separated 
by by technology. We are in Saskatchewan that's considered the center of Canada, but it's actually remote. Somebody from the north can be remote, but they're actually the center of the world. Toronto can be seen as the center of Canada um, as a city, but yet it's really far removed from where I am right now, which is in Poland, but I actually work out of the Clinton traditional territory that's unseated in Northern BC, which is near Prince George. So given the, those ideas and so some of those terminologies, I guess I'll ask um, you, Robert, first, um, how do you think, um, how, what is your definition of Northern or remote or rural and how perhaps it fits in the work and the efforts that you do in making sure that you continue to be a trapper, you continue to be a hunter, you work with Nameo and Sturgeon and you and I have both worked on the kiosk which is seen as really far north from Winnipeg, but really it was the center of your livelihood and your way of life. Can you perhaps speak to some of the work that you've been doing protecting Nameo and uh, the sturgeon and your way of life in Split Lake or Tatasquiak? Robert? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, hi, okay, perfect. Hi. Okay, good. Um, yeah, um, before we begin, I'm just gonna say some stuff in Cree. Um, I'm more comfortable speaking my language. Um, Robert Spencer and Disney guys on a week up Marat behind Disney guys on as in the new year. That as we are going to see now, they go to the guy as of piggy go on. Basically, <laughs> Translate that into English. Um, my name is Robert Spence, my Christian name. My traditional name, my spirit name is uh, he who sits with the caribou in the West. And um, a lot of my work is around the land and water up north in Tatasquayak, where I'm from. I was born, I was born just out outside the community raised in split raised at the task at split on split lake um ever since i was a a young kid growing up uh raised by both my grandfathers um uh, one who raised me on the water and the other one who raised me on the land i viewed both of them as both my professors and my first teachers Growing up where I did, learning from them, from what they taught me, what they handed down to me from the people who passed it down to them. Um, a lot of things have changed from just in such a short period of time. I'm 54 years old now. I've seen a lot of changes happening. I've seen the South growing and growing and the South becoming more and more hungry and starving for more resources, for more land, and now more water. As we see from the the news and press releases all over the world that there's a water shortage everywhere happening all around the globe, especially in the Western Prairie provinces and for Manitoba Hydro who relies on the water to produce the power that they use within our territories. Um, it's hard to know where to begin to talk about the things that you guys want to know about because the, it's immense, it's huge. And to be able to reiterate what it is that you, you want to know about what's happening up north is impossible to do within such a short period of time given that there's been so much happening up north, the devastation that we've seen. That's all that that's that's all that I've seen. To be honest with you, I don't I don't come to you to sound like a downer, 
But that's all that I've seen growing up is the the depressing state of the world that I live in now, where we're being made to live in an unnatural world and expected to live in a natural way while seeing our natural world degraded and desecrated and ruined and destroyed all for the price of all for the price of all for development um i work mainly with the with the environmental issues at home it wasn't my decision to do that it wasn't i didn't decide just to hey i'm going to go work on a land and water that seems like a very good thing to work with i didn't i grew up into this a lot of us did and there is no turning it off like a light switch um, a lot of what happens in the south and western prairie provinces affects how we live up north in northern manitoba I'm sure all the other First Nations, as well as all the other um, towns and communities, feel the same way. Our the water we get around our com at our community on Split Lake, at a, at our com community of Tatasquak, is comes from uh, 1.4 million square kilometers of watersheds that flow right past our community of Tatasquak. By the time all that water reaches our community, all that water has been used up already. And I don't know if you all heard, but we just won one of the biggest class action lawsuits on drinking water for the First Nations in, in Canada. And we were we were to lead on that, uh, along with uh, two other First Nations from Ontario, Curve Lake and Niskantica, I believe they're, they're called. But back home, I was the I was the lead on that file, working with uh, Western science uh, scientists to try and figure out what it was our past elders were saying. They said that water that you see flowing past our community now is not a life-sustaining, life-giving source of energy anymore that it used to be. Man choose one. They said it's got bugs in it, meaning and translation. It's got it's poison. They knew before Western science was able to prove that it was no good for our people anymore, that it would make our people sick, and it was making our people sick. And we had to we had to resort to using Western science to prove it, even though we kept telling Health Canada, Canada, Manitoba, federal and provincial ministers that our water was unsafe and un, un, unfit to swim or drink in or eat from anymore. They kept persisting. Their tests proved that our water was good. So that's an impact on us, our livelihood, our culture, our ability to be able to maintain our culture and our spiritual connection to the water and to the land around our community. Because a lot of the decisions that are made for the people in the North are made for from the people who live in the South and in Ottawa, from people who don't have a clue on what's happening at ground zero. Those are impacts that we are facing still today because of the fact politicians seem to think that we're still the invalids that there, we're still the words of the state that we that we should be thought for. You know what I mean? Um, like we can't think for ourselves. We're not, we're unable to determine our own past or in our own futures, our, our own past forward. So that's an impact. An impact. Another impact um, that I see happening is the expansion of Winnipeg. Right now, uh, I'm not sure if any of you read in the newspapers, but. Just recently, there was about 250 million liters of raw sewage that was dumped into the Red River because of a, a pipe leak, and then two pipe leaks from sewage pipes. All that water eventually flows into Lake Winnipeg and then down the Nelson River into our community at Tatasquia. And then that's not the only instance where the there's been sewage dumps of uh, sewage into the Red and the Sydney Rivers from the city of Winnipeg. It it's in the billions and billions and billions of liters. 
that's impacted how we're able to conduct ourselves daily. I I was no longer able to take my children out in the lake. Uh, Manitoba Hydro Development killed the lake through eutrophication. The amount of sewage and sediments and debris flowing down into Split Lake through the many re uh, through the many rivers Manitoba Hydro operates and manipulates killed Split Lake for us. And because it killed Split Lake, um, not very many people understand. Um, they they have the false misconception that the North is a uh, very clean and very pristine and a very healthy environment to live in. It's not. It's not where I come from. It's devastated. It's impacted. It's desecrated. We're the toilet bowl of the North. So when you say the North, it kind of paints. Um, it's it's kind of like a what North? You have to go further north away from the community just to be able to feel one with one with the land and one with water anymore. Because it feels like the South, the South is the cancer of the world. It, it's spreading. Further north you go, it, it touches all of us in every which way possible. I wasn't able to take my kids out onto the water as much as I would, as as much as I was taken out on onto it. My grandchildren too. So what left what what's left for them to to do if if i can't go out on the water anymore and if i don't have the means to pay for a plane to take them out to a clean lake up north when we only have an access program that limits our abilities to fly up north through the one of the programs hydro gave to the community that our elders fought for the access program it's a spring and fall access program so I have to wait for either of those seasons to be able to take my children out on the lake. And I was a commercial fisherman on Split Lake for quite a number of years. I was a I was a little guy on a boat helping my grandfather clean and dress his fish as soon as I was able to hold a knife in my hand. And I was I was out on the water every day. I failed grade one because of him. <laughs> because he told my parents that when my parents were complaining I was going out on the lake too much. My late grandfather told them, never mind you. I was at Kiabit High School. He said, get out of here. I'm teaching him what, what he needs to learn. He's still going to school, and that's that's what's going to matter later, is what he said. And I'm in disbelief because I can't believe that he was able to see so far into the future what he was able to see then. I'm not sure if I'm able to answer your question properly, but that, just... that was really powerful, uh, as always, Robert. Thank you so much, and you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, a lot of people get the the view that hydro is clean and green. I know we get that that um, argument a lot on Site C, which is um, uh, between it's the project that's currently being built in straddles bc and alberta so the same arguments go and with my work in manitoba hydro is hydro is clean it's green it's renewable but it's not always clean and it's definitely not always green but thank you it's so not, much robert one other thing it's not renewable it's in it's reusable they have to recycle it <laughs> Very true. Thank you so much. And I think your perspective of where the north is when it's south and you have to go further north, it's definitely adding to the the idea of location, where we're where we're centering ourselves in our world. So I'll, I'll move and ask, perhaps, do you think that you are located north, Renell? Are you in the north, in the south? Are you remote? Or what are you in the center of your own world? <laughs> Uh, ge geographically, I feel like I'm in center because growing up, I always think, uh, I watch the news a lot. I still, I used to, I didn't realize how much I watch the news to like every morning I sit there and I watch global events and the way I see natural disasters, what we're taught in school, it's like, I'm so glad we live where there's no earthquakes, no water disasters. Um, but we do face forest fire challenges. 
So I consider myself north. Yes, I do 100%. Um, although there is farther north. So I um, <laughs> think it's a to a to extent I'm northern. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about the work that you're involved in um, in the Losh, um and how that oh. maybe ties to the conversation on kind of sustainable livelihoods and your efforts at safeguarding cultural heritage? I, I know that you're involved in language uh, learning, which I think is super exciting. And I'd love to hear more about that. Mercy and Estan but first, introduce myself. So I'm saying thank you for having me today and speaking today. And I'll tell you Northern answer after I introduce myself. I'm with Robert. We introduce ourselves in our language because that's how we understand. Um, so she Renal Sylvester Hushe can tell us to what's in. Clearwater of the Nation Band member has the own treaty territory. So we're located in north northwest part of the province. Um, my name is Nell Sylvester. I am from Lala, Saskatchewan, and I am a treaty aid band member from Clearwater for Denny Nation. That's about seven kilometers of here from here. And I come to you from the Lalash Friendship Center as the Honoring Her Spark coordinator tied in with the Cultural Humility coordinator. And what that is, is we work in five areas in the program. It was a pilot project two years ago, the Honoring Her Spark. Um, the Aboriginal Friendship Center of Saskatchewan came to do a pilot project with the community to get information and data to see what we could do to help females. Um, that how our women are strong, despite the challenges every day brings to us um, the program wanted to help. So what came from the program is we have five areas we work in. Um, I'm not sure if Kristen mentioned this, but we go through, we work with women of all ages in the community, um, plus two spirited. Um, and we work in the areas of education, employment, self-care, language, culture, and life skills. Um, and the program there is, it's to help everyone. Um, the story I bring out of it is like, when, while Robert was speaking, he was, there's a lot of similarities we I can connect to and a lot of differences in the sense that land and our culture and who we are and living heritage, like you say. And it's uh, two years ago, I did a Mother's Day event and at work and don't I show it's actually not any. The, hum, the amount of women that were there, because we did haircuts, free haircuts, and uh, like self-care, the nails, the eyebrows, um, the massage, we had an energy healer, because these are all things, as a mother myself, that I realized weren't access, we wouldn't have access to them so easy in the North. Um, the next, the nearest city is four hours away, put it that way, or five hours, and then seven hours. Um, so I brought it to us, because I could do it, I can have access to where I work. I make sure I can do that for myself, but there's still people who can't have that access to it. So when I brought it home, we had all the self-care day and one day was not enough, I'll tell you that. When you did like two to three days, like we had to turn people away, I felt so bad, but the demand, the high demand of just self-care for for our, our women, like we, and I'm not sure how you guys have your belief on the family structure and roles, but Nah, mom, we say not mom is in, in Dene. How do you say it? We're the rocks of the family. As grandmothers, as moms, as sisters, as aunties, like we, we're the glue. We're the one who teaches them. We're the one from home and everything. So it's, um, it took me, it took me a long time to realize that because of being a teacher in the profession, you get sidetracked with work. You, the Western ways of surviving, like he says, Robert, like we have all these ways of their ways of living, but in the time that we have our own ways, we do have our own ways of survival and living and teachings. So going to your question, um, the program and how we live in the North, um, 
it's I can like he said we can we can go on all day about this as a teacher we can talk all day hours weeks but the magnitude of it is it's our livelihood it's who we are yeah first it's enka he brought me so my great grand my grandpa my late grandpa when I live in this city, he would bring me wild meat and um, whatever it was, moose meat, fish, berries, he bought me stuff from the land. So I would have it still. And it was very brief. It was a little bit here and there when he would come for his visits. And it was, um, it was not being able to see it then, but you look at it now, how strongly knit strongly tied we are to our culture and our land and our language um the way he raised me always Dene. the way he raised me rabbit like come and eat they say she and you like he would say did you eat come and eat um and it was always wild food his table always had wild food i loved it and now that i see it i live at home in the north i've been here for oh i think 18 years i've been at home since I was 19 um and I'm 34 now and the way I see it is like my history with my family grandpa and how where we live and how I grew up and the way my family like he's like Robert says they kept it within us like I said the families right they 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 know their job so we don't die out if we die out what happens who are we what do we do and the way yeah, the way he always fed me wild food and the big, the big, how do you say it? The big, the bigger part for me, the bigger challenge is, yes, education is important. I'm a teacher. Yes, I believe in that we, we have to go to school. It's the answer, but also our own education is just as important. And I say that because, um, when you take the time to sit and really think, you really look back at your upbringing is I didn't know my grandpa was giving me the knowledge that I would have to teach my daughter one day. I can talk about it. I can say how I grew up, but that's not doing anything for her. Don't I understand that the way I teach her, we're very land-based. In university, we're taught straight land-based. That's all I know. And I noticed that it came out is when I went to, um, I taught in Fort Mackay First Nation last year in Alberta. And it's just right next door. Like we're like a two and a half hour drive. Um, it looks far, but it's just right there. And then it's, uh, it's, it showed me how much land-based hands-on teaching I do. And I didn't know I had that much knowledge until I went somewhere to teach our people our fellow brothers and sisters in the treat in that treaty area is like the language I the knowledge I have as a teacher, the knowledge I have as land based, the fish, how to clean fish, how to clean a rabbit, how to clean a moose, how to make dry meat, all of these things. The list goes on, right? So yeah, it's the real the, the real knowledge keepers, like how Robert explains as the grandparents, like they're this goes into a further question. I'm sorry if I'm <laughs> going over, but um our livelihoods are instilled in us. When the elders speak to you, you have to listen. And I'm curious. I'm a curious person because I really have to figure out things, right? Like why, 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 so I can see later on. But there's reasons and ways that they're telling you things that you have to see later on for your own self and you understand it. And I love these questions. I really commend you your team on bringing these questions or these questions up um but yes the I hope that answers your question the safeguarding culture like my life everybody I work with in this office here um our team here we have a lot of partnerships we fully 100 percent sustain our culture our language our livelihood here and I could give you a year of events but I won't <laughs> but we have it we do it year round seasonal we go by the season so yes we do it 
Thank you so much, Ronel. Um, uh, Vincent, I'll move over to you. Um, given that Ronel is talking about transmission and passing on that livelihood that's in us and kind of teaching the younger generations uh, kind of the the traditional way of educating, the pedagogies that have existed within that culture. Can you speak to us about your efforts? I know you're very much involved with the trapping program. Can you speak to us a little bit about that and some of the efforts that you're doing with sustainable livelihoods in, in Yellowknife? For sure. Uh, thank you. So first off, um, yes, I am joining you from Yellowknife um, with the Department of Environment and Climate Change with the Government of the Northwest Territories. The disclaimer that goes at the beginning of this is, yes, I've agreed to participate in this panel as a government employee, but certainly don't take anything that I say over the next hour or remainder of this as government policy or government positions. Um, some of them certainly are, but some of them certainly come from my own experiences and things like that. So um, we'll go on from that. Um, from my introduction and sort of see that I come from New Zealand, um, and in speaking with um, a Métis friend of mine, um, I used to not introduce myself that way or write that sort of stuff down in a bio and I try and kind of hide it. And he said, you bring it into the room with you anyway. Those are, that's your family, that's your history. That's who you bring into the room with you. Anyway, you should say it out loud. You should put it out there so that people know. Um, and it's your relationships. He sort of said, these are your relationships. These are your relations. And if you're introducing yourself to elders, this is how they would place you. And so they need to know that um, as you go in. So I've certainly, over the last, um, that's a sort of a newer thing for me to, to put that down on my introductions. Um, when it comes to sort of work is certainly I am not Indigenous. Um, and that sits really as a central sort of pillar of my, ex or work that I do or try to do is really think hard as I sort of do any work in this area is around sustainable livelihoods because that's the unit that I used to work in with the government here and um, is understanding my own culture as I move forward um, because my own culture carries through everything that I say, everything that I do, everything that I impact. And so I need to understand it. I need to know it before I can do work in other cultures or work with other cultures. And so one of the bigger pieces of work that I have done recently is, um, as you probably maybe remember from my introduction, I used to work in the corrections program, but our unit here at the other the government department is responsible for our trapping support programs in the north. And one of the things that I was able to do was help coordinate a proper training program at the correctional facility here in Yellowknife. And one of the goals, I mean, obviously the goal as it was put in was sort of this economic passing on of trapping economic knowledge to individuals. But realistically, the main goal was to provide um, a facilitation method for the passing of traditional knowledge and traditional teachings and values and indigenous elders and teachings from um, elders to individuals who are in the correctional center who may not have had that opportunity growing up to get that those teachings um, and certainly if at the end of that people went out on the land and trapped and did that for um, economic benefits great um, but really from my point of view the goal was just to set up a system whereby this knowledge could be passed um, between participants um, as well as um, from our the instructors and stuff that we had brought in. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the work that I do. I think I'll stop there so we can move on to some of the other questions. Thank you so much, Vincent. And thank you for locating or situating yourself as you did. Um, I'll just make a quick comment here that when I first reached out and I reached out simply because I just, I knew I had heard that the Northwest Territories territorial government had this program for, well, both trapping and also language, but um, transmission and mentor apprenticeship, which is something we're really interested in in our chair and our work at Living Her at Heritage Saskatchewan. And I was really interested to have that um, perspective. And I met with Vincent and his colleague, Sarah Dennis, who's in the Sustainable Livelihoods Department. We had a really great conversation and they were both, you challenged me and said, well, 
why do you want to talk to us? Like, really, you should be talking to community members, which normally I would 100% agree. However, in this case, I think because of the context of this webinar and the larger project it's part of, that trying to, to bridge community with those policymakers in a better way. And I'm really inspired by um, seeing that a territorial government has a department that's called sustainable livelihoods, first of all. <laughs> I don't think there's anything like that in the South that I'm aware of at any provincial level. Um, and that even, and I'm sure we'll get into this when we get into other questions, Vincent, but you know, you and Sarah spoke to me about the actual methods that you as government employees use to connect with communities, which again, I have never heard of such a thing in the South. And I find that really inspiring. So I'm really glad that you're here today to bring that perspective as someone working for government and also as someone non-Indigenous who, as you're saying, it's so vitally important that we, we acknowledge our own culture because you're right, we're bringing it with us whether we're aware of it or not. And if we're not aware of it, we can actually end up causing a lot of harm in our relations. So, but before I get into other questions um, specifically, I know that Robert has to leave us soon. Are you still with us right now, Robert? He may have had to drop off. I know he joined us from his truck. He was telling us at the start that he's his, I think maybe it was his grandpa was the first um, switchboard operator in his community and how things have changed that he's able to join us on his cell phone and his truck. But I'm not sure if he's with us anymore. Agnieszka might check in with him. Um, so I will move on, but if he comes back, we'll maybe jump to him again just because of his time constraints. Um, but in the meantime, I, I'll go down to another question. Um, so this is a bit of a follow-up from from what we've just been talking about, which is how do traditional activities such as um, what you've you've all been talking about, trapping, hunting, fishing, gathering, you know, um, food preparation in traditional ways, how does that intersect with economic realities in in the regions that you're that you're living and working in? Um, and what are the tensions at play with maintaining that cultural continuity? Um, in the face of those economic realities, whether they be positive or negative or have um, a combination of both. So maybe I'll start with you this time, Vincent, um, and then move on to Rennell and, and Robert, if he's able to come back. Give me the hard question first. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, 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 this is an interesting question and I know it's not, I don't think it's an easy one to answer is from what from the people that we speak to when we do a lot of our engagement and other activities and we are always in contact with our hunters and trappers and our harvesters around a lot of the support that we do provide them and what we're hearing is is that this is no longer or very rarely is this just a lifestyle that somebody can maintain so this is no longer um, the way that people can, and I don't think lifestyle is the right word for it. Um, it's no longer can be the primary source for nutrition, for economic, for shelter, for all of the economic needs of a family um, within the communities that they live in. And so that's the economic reality is that most people need to have some other form of funding being delivered to them in some way, shape, or form. Um, and what we're hearing from that is, is that makes that idea of cultural continuity harder um, because a lot of the activities that, um, that are associated with sort of cultural transmission aren't happening as frequently because if I need to work, I don't hunt every day or I don't hunt it as frequently as if, if I didn't have to work. Yeah. And so what does this mean? And, or how does that impact that sort of culture transmission or continuity? And I'd almost say that I think the best word for it or the best thinking about it is cultural autonomy is, um, is are the economic realities of life wherever we are impacting my choices on how I can transmit my culture to my descendants? Um, 
and I guess that's that's a question I'll leave because I don't have an answer to that. But I think that's one of the sort of be a framing question for me is if if I'm thinking about that as if that's a question somebody's asking, how do I even answer that? So I'll leave that at that. Thank you so much, Vincent. And Renelle, I saw you take your mute off and I'm sorry to jump in, but Robert is back. And do you mind if I jump to him quickly um, before he has to leave the webinar? Sure. Okay, sorry and thank you. So Robert, I, I understand you're back with us. So I know you only have a few more minutes that you can um, be with us today. So I just wanted to leave off asking you, similarly to what I just asked Vincent, in terms of, of cultural continuity and continuing traditions in the context of what you were speaking about earlier in the way that the North is now, um, what's your, what would you leave us with in terms of guidance or advice or um, even warnings of, of how, um, the North needs to be, what needs to happen for that cultural continuity to be able to happen? Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, yes. One of the things that worries me about the uh, government policy and mandates today, especially with uh, the topic of trapping is the government's policies on trap lines and how government views them as as trapping as a commercial activity our people have trapped for a millennia going back thousands and thousands of years and because it was our people's ability to be able to to hunt fish and trap and maintain that way of life and survive in such a, a, a hostile environment, especially in the North. Um, our people were coerced and manipulated into believing that uh, a $10 piece of paper that they were told that they had to pay for and able to, just so that they would be able to inhabit a certain part of a territory. Um, oh my goodness. Um, can I, I'll, I'll I'll, I'll give you an example, okay? Um, I went to build a, a, a cabin on what the government views as my trap line. It was it, it's, it is not a trap line. It's our family's traditional territory where my grandfather took his family and his, fa his family took him when he was young. And that's where my grandfather took me. It wasn't a trap line. It was our, it was a, a communal area where other families would gather, um, hunt, fish, and trap. When I first went up there to build a cabin, you know what happened? Uh, natural resources from Manitoba came in there with a helicopter and landed at what they call the trap line 51 and section 520 in northern Manitoba. They said, hey, what are you doing here? I said, excuse me? They said, you heard me. What are you doing here? What do you mean? To, what do you mean? Like, where do you get off coming over here, landing here in our territory, asking me a question in the tone that you're asking me? Introduce yourself first. And he says, never mind. You see who I am. You know who I am. And you know what I'm about. What are you doing here? And then he took a look, a look over my shoulder at the lumber that was piled up there. And he said, I hope you're not going to be building a cabin without first acquiring a permit. I said, excuse me, who do I have to ask permission for, for from first to, just so I could build our, our family's dwelling within our own family's traditional territory? I don't have to ask you or the federal or provincial government if, it, if I have your permission to build a dwelling within our own family's traditional territory. Then he said, well, what are you doing here then besides building a cabin? Are you fishing? I said, it's none of your business what I'm doing here, What if I'm fishing or not. We're here to survive and maintain a way of life and a culture that we've lived with for thousands and thousands of years. And then he said, well, I'm going to go take a look at what you got down at the shoreline. So he went down for a walk to the shoreline and he pulled a string. And at the end of that string was one sturgeon tied to the, tethered to the shore. And then he says, how many of these do you have? And he said, just that one. I, I, I respectfully 
would like to request for you to let go of that string and not bother my food, please, and thank you. And then he said, well, I hope this is all that you have. And he says, none of your business how many we have. We're here, we've been able to harvest from the land and the water for thousands and thousands of years and be able to live with our ancestors and our with our relatives in, a, in such a way that we only take what we need. It's your development that's choked off the river up uh, upstream of the Churchill River at Missy Falls Control Structure that your government and Man your corporation of Manitoba Hydro that built Missy Falls Control Structure that cut off and choked off the and rerouted and diverted the flow of the Churchill River into the Lower Nelson River at Split Lake just so that Manitoba Hydro can power their dams on the Lower Nelson River system that killed off the sturgeon and you're worried about me catching one sturgeon. And then um, it, got, it got to be a pretty heated argument there after a while and then my uncle who, who heard the whole conversation came out and before um, resources was able to carry sidearms, they came there with an RCMP officer. The RCMP officer unzipped the zipper on the side to expose his sidearm. My uncle said to him, ah, put that little thing away. We got guns bigger than that. And then my dad overheard the conversation that my uncle had with the RCMP officer. Then my dad came out and said, put that little thing away. We got guns that can shoot farther than that. So the RCMP officer pulled his zipper back down again and hit his sidearm. And then that de-escalated the whole thing. And then resources said, okay, okay, we got off on the wrong foot here. The hell with you, you got on the wrong trap line. This is our territory. You get the hell out and don't come back. So that's what we did. And government seems to think that they can control us and coerce us into thinking that we need their permission to do what it is that we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years. Why is it that we have to be asking for permission, just like our people have had to ask for permission to leave the reserve before, and we're still being treated the same? Our people, because trapping is going down, are still able to maintain and hang on to that part of their culture because it's who we are. We're a people of the land. Our umbilical cords are tied to the land, the land that we we were we were given to hold on to and protect for our future generations and the generations not yet born and those all to come after that. We're we're only here borrowing the land from them. And that's what we were taught growing up. And right now, um, back home in our community, um, we we have land-based teachings and uh, land-based learning. One of the one of the big land land-based uh, learning act um, uh, conferences coming up is in Tatashbiak in our community, where about ten or twelve uh, different schools from different parts of the province are coming up to Tatashbiak to take part in land-based learning activities in our community. And we're going to be taking these kids out from different uh, communities, out to different parts of our territory where we've built cabins all over our territory. And because a lot of the trappers who held on to these trap lines that government calls or the traditional territories, we've opened up and built cabins everywhere going as far north as we could possibly go, as far south, as far east, as far west, just to be able to hang on and maintain our cultural identities of who we are as an Inuit and oh like there's so many different things uh the people who who are the teachers now are now going and traveling to meetings in the south like take I, I'm only one like the frustrations you you hear sometimes in my voice are not only my frustrations, but the frustrations of the people who are standing beside me, behind me, and in front of me. The youth, the kids, the children, the old, the aged, the elderly, all of them. We all share the same voice and we all feel the same way. Our lands are being um, taken away from government, from mining industries. They're coming in, they're kicking down the door. They're not just knocking softly at the 
tapping their fingernails at the door. They're kicking down the doors, wanting into our territories to expand, to develop more, to ruin more, to devastate more lands, more waters. Our, our abilities to be able to move about our lands are being um, are slowly being taken away, just like our rights are slowly being taken away. We had inherent rights before we, we were given treaty rights. Before the rights were be before the rights were recognized within all the treaties, we had the rights, the natural laws behind us that that gave us those rights. Like what government is doing today in Western society, they say they need more. Like I'm sitting in the city of Winnipeg, 24 hours a day, I see this Amazon building next door to me, vehicles going in and out. Constantly, semi trucks going constantly all hours of the night, trains going all hours of the night. The South is a big week to go. You know what a week to go is? It's it's a evil spirit that um, that eats and eats and eats and more, 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 more demands more. That's what we see the the South and the developing world doing to our world. Oh my God, man, like. This frustrates me. Everything that's being asked of me, like even my partners, Jonathan, Joseph, Michael, and Mike, all of us, all of us feel the same way. We get flustered and we get frustrated. We keep saying the same things over and over and over again at different conferences, different meetings, different boardrooms. Same things we keep reiterating over and over and over again, time and time again, and still the same thing. Oh, uh, we met with you. We sympathize with you. We empathize with you. Um, but we're doing it. This is the way it's going to be. Whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. And then we're sitting, we're, we're over here up north watching the devastation happening. You know, we drink water from bottles. We don't drink water from the river anymore. We can't drink it. We see fish floating by dead. We see fish floating up, floundering on the surface of the water dead. We see moose, four different moose already, 2017, floating by the community dead in the water. A thousand pound animal. What killed it? The water. That's all we can see that might have killed it because the fish are dying from it. The kids are breaking out from it. We see the kids breaking out in rashes and bleeding all over their bed sheets because of the water and the impacts from the water that we see happening from the south. And still, people don't get it. They don't get what's happening over here. It has an impact on us over there. Meanwhile, we're the ones trying to raise the red flags all over the world. Hey, wait a minute. Look what's happening over here. Look what you guys are doing. It's not just happening to us, but it's going to happen to you too. It was told to us already that our future generations were going to be drinking water from a bottle. And we are living that time now that our elders spoke about. Now we're, we had to fight the government of Canada to get a new source of drinking water. At one time when I was on a, on a, on a Zoom meeting just like this, there was a person from Gimli, there was a person from Selkirk, and there was a person from um, Winnipeg that were on that conference, that Zoom meeting, that we were that we had to ask for to see if we could get more funding for, from, to see if we could keep studying the water, and then I asked, excuse, can can I ask you where you're from, sir? The guy said, oh, I'm from uh, Selkirk, Manitoba. Okay. Selkirk, you guys don't even drink water from the Red River. You drink water from underground. You you drink water from underground aquifers pumped up from four wells to, to service your city. And then I asked the other guy, Winnipeg. He says he was from Winnipeg. Oh, you're one to talk. You don't even drink water from the both the Red or Cinnaboyne rivers that your city sits in between. You draw water from a 150 kilometer long aqueduct that goes to the all the way to the Manitoba Ontario border. Show Lake 40 to to pump water to your city because you won't want to you don't want to drink water from the Cinnaboyne or the Red or even Lake Winnipeg. And I asked the other guy, where are you from? He says, Oh, I'm from Gimli. Wow, this is quite unique and strange. You guys don't even drink water from Lake Winnipeg. 
10th largest inland lake in the world, 12th largest fresh inland lake in the world as well, right? In Canada, something like that. And they don't even draw water from Lake Winnipeg. They drink, they drink water from underground aquifers. Four pumps service their city. But yet all the other First Nations down river of the Lake Winnipeg have to drink water from the Nelson River. The same water that they don't want to drink from, we have to drink from. They say it's safe enough to drink, safe enough to swim in, and safe enough to eat from. And they said our science has been able to prove for the past 30 years what your people have been saying. Your water is safe and okay to drink, swim in, and eat from. Our science proves it. Then we went a step further. We took their science and used it against them and sent our samples out to different labs out of Canada to green water labs in Florida to prove that our water was not safe. We, we tested the water way beyond our parameters and found out we have cylindrospermopsin in our water because now we have blue green algaes blooming all over Split Lake that we never used to have before. And then from those from what I've been able to gather, there's 36 different types of blue-green algaes found in nature. Of those 36, there was six found on Split Lake. And of those six, there was three known to be very toxic and harmful and fatal to humans and animals. And then in 2021, we found out that there was cylindrospermopsin in the water. And I read up on it. And from the little that I read up on, there, it was mainly found in New Zealand. Australia and Africa. What the hell is it doing in northern Manitoba, in, in northern Canada, in waters that are supposed to be clean and pristine? What is it doing there? And why is it that Canada didn't do its due diligence and protect our rights that whom, with whom is supposed to be protecting our rights? They were the ones telling us that your water is safe and okay and clean to drink. But yet when, when we had a whole delegation of people from Manitoba, Canada, MI, uh, uh, Manitoba Hydro, Health Canada come there, I had a guy run down to the lake with a five-gallon Robert, Robert, I'm sorry to cut you off. I really am. Um, I hear the passion in your voice, and I know, I know how difficult this is. I just, we're running out of time, and um, I really yeah. want Renell to be able to speak as well. Okay, all right. And I'm so sorry to cut you off. And I, I know that you've repeated this so many times, like you said, and to not have the changes that are needed is devastating. And I'm really sorry. Um, I wish that I personally could change that. And thank you for bringing your your words to us because people in the South do need to hear it. We, we do need to hear it. Um, two minute segments on the news don't really do, they don't do the trick. So I appreciate your time today so much. And I appreciate what you're doing for your community and what you're doing for the North in general and coming to this today to let us all know what it's like and to disabuse us of the notion that the North is this pure, free, clean place that we can go and, and enjoy on a holiday. Um, you're telling us what the reality is to live there. And that's so, um, it's so strong in your voice um, that change needs to happen. So I'm gonna thank you again for your time and I'm gonna turn it over to Renelle um, so that she can have a chance to speak and Vincent as well from their perspectives where they're living in the North. And um, I wish you the best Robert in the rest of your day. Uh, hi, it's Tita. It takes a while sometimes. So when I speak, when I answer your questions, one of these questions you ask, Sometimes they take a second to think about. Um, I want to commend Fred Ostoff as Vincent. Like you said, those people who told you what to do are right. There's room for everybody in this world, every single person. And if you have that ancestral background, you'll say it loud and proud. We've never had the chance to do that for years. And as each of us answer these questions, as Robert says, he was hitting a lot of He's thinking a lot in my head, as you can probably see, I'm nodding, right? The history. And it's the passion that comes from this work that people do to share the stories they share. It's the passion that we have um, to fight these battles. And as Vincent was speaking earlier and the way Robert was sharing um, his experiences, 
I was thinking here and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna see if I <laughs> didn't lose my train of thought, but it in the beginning, I didn't share about the cultural humility part that I do. Um, I'm big on history. I love history. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't even know where we're going. We wouldn't even know who we are. Like your ancestral teachings, Vincent, like you wouldn't even know who you are in this world. What's your purpose here if you didn't have that? Do you know what you what's behind you? Who's behind you? And the cultural humility training, um, it started in Newfoundland and we made it to fit Saskatchewan, Northern Saskatchewan specifically. And it's basically everything I learned in university. I should have been learning in life at it, since I was born. I had to go to university for this. And it's Canadian history. And like Robert said, he was our people. We've been fighting our battle for centuries since Canada and just people made that first agreement that made that treaty signing. Like, oh my God, I just repeat the history so much. It's insane. And it's my passion is teaching that training. Like I can, I love I love it. It's just like, I wish everyone knew this. And the, from what we're doing here is we're educating everyone and everybody has someone to teach something. And we all have something to learn from everybody, every single person that we cross paths with. And you can see like, like my, my vision is like when someone speaks to you, they're telling their story. They're not just the conversation and brush off. Their stories, their real life stories. And as like Robert was just finished sharing with us, like these are real life stories that people don't know about. These are real life stories that people experience and who's there to advocate for ourselves. If that guy didn't have that knowledge to defend himself or his cabin towards those, those visitors, what would have happened? If he didn't have the English translation, if he didn't have the knowledge of the history, like who knows what that would have happened, right? So it's it uh, really brought me to that history piece and the culture and humility training and in university it brought it brought me back to a question I remember it took me a long time to answer this question because I was really thinking about it right I grew up in this city I came home for junior high I left for high school I graduated in Prince Albert and I came back home the day after high school back to Lush and literally day after like I was just like I don't know something just kept drawing me back home and I noticed that the more I reflect on my life, when you're not around your people, your language, your food, um, your land, your ancestors, your grandparents, your families, all of that that makes Dene Sutlina Dene, like and every, all the indigenous people in Canada, when you don't have that, you lose yourself more. You, you know, you're, there's no, um, it's embedded in you. So you need to bring it alive. You need to waken it up and like bring it out. So me being home, the, the professor she asked me one time our question sorry for the for the project was uh can we decolonize those Robert and Vincent were sharing can we decolonize is it possible to decolonize our lives and it's like a good three hours a good run on the treadmill like physical my physical exercise like no we can't so when Robert talks about our livelihood and your question it's like one or the other, and when Vincent said about another source of income, we don't need money to survive. The government gave us these, these things to survive since first contact. They traded pots, they traded flour, they traded, us, traded these things with us so they can survive in their world, so they can survive in our world. And we can't decolonize. We're so intergrained in this Western systemic ways of living that we can't decolonize 100%, but we can decolonize in ways that our land language culture our heritage is there that we can still advocate for and, and waking it up make it known to the world and it's um in ways though that are going to help us so when i say that is like government ways so sorry I'm, I'm still practicing my language i didn't grow up with it right but i've been way to relearn and re-speak it as saying when Haba, when my grandpa was raising me like I spent a lot of time with him I didn't realize how much I was his like sidekick to my brother told me when he passed and it's we were going to the store one day pick me up he said I'm going to the store he said you need anything he said and I would go with him because we're taught in our Dene laws, again, I forgot to mention this earlier, is we have Dene laws and they're so ingrained in us and 
they're really good teachings because our elders, we wouldn't be who we are if we didn't have our elders. So we're just, it's in our everyday habit normal normally that take care of our elders. I go with him to help him with his groceries, right? And he would buy me groceries. I wouldn't need it, but I would still help him. And there was days where my daughter would want like, you know, the odd popsicle or a loaf of bread we would need. He would buy it for me because in the North things are expensive. You know, it's hard financially. You know, you have to choose your power bill over your food sometimes. Those electric, electric power bills up here, hefty, very hefty. And he would, I remember going, coming home from the store that time and he would say, he would have his uh, pension on his wallet. He'd take every penny out. He took everything, all his cash. He cashed his check. And I was like, can't, uh, don't I was talking to How come you grab that much money? I said, because the bank holds it, right? Holds our money. The bank holds our money. He said, my girl, there's samba sets, Isa. This is my money, he said. I worked for it. I put my life into this and the hours for this money. Nobody should have it. He means the bank, the bank charges, the other, every fees. You know, there's always money somewhere going somewhere, but he worked for it. And then he told me, he was telling me, like, never trust the government. You don't trust the government, my girl. And back then, being a teenager, like only 19, 20, right? I'm like, it still stick with me, sticks with me today. So when Robert speaks about it, when Vincent in your line of work, like for years, centuries before me, my time, my nine generations where my life started, the government never helped us. They, to an extent, they would, but they've never helped us 100% to sustain our, our livelihood the way we need it. They'll never listen to us 100% and give us 100% what we want and need. And that's another story, my own story. When we had COVID two years ago, the world shut down, right? And guess where the Northern people were? Do you guys know about the province in Saskatchewan that time? In the province, the Northern people were had a blockade. We couldn't leave past Green Lake. We couldn't leave Wolosh. We were stuck here. I'll say it that way because we couldn't leave. But guess who could come in? Guess who could come to the north? Southern people. We couldn't leave for groceries. And this is the part I mean about stories. I uh, We have a family friend from the uh, reserve. They went for an appointment. They couldn't leave. They were blocked in. An appointment they've been waiting for three months. because I think it was a surgery. Three months you couldn't leave. Like, are you kidding me? This is someone's health on the line. Isn't that against human rights? So it's like a... Like he said, like, it's my grandpa's right. He's right. We're all right. We have these reasons for doing things. And it's like the government will never 100% help our people in ways that it comes to our our teachings without the money. Because like he said, again, it's the money that people, they development, they strive on. And it's a, uh, it's like the saying, I'll leave you with the saying that there was a, from, I think from the, from the United States, um, I don't know. I shared this with Kristen is like only when the last tree is cut down, the last fish is poisoned and the rivers are poisoned. People then will learn you can't eat money and you can't, can't at all. Thank you, Renal. Also very powerful. Um, time's running short. I know we could speak about this all day and for many, like you said, days, weeks. Um, there's a few questions we didn't get to, but just, and this, <laughs> trying to think how to word this, because I hear what you're saying, Renelle, about, you know, and let's be honest, that is, that's the government, they take money as tax, and then they pay it back into our society in a nutshell. That's what they do, and then they enact policies as well. So, given that that's what we're living in right now, it's not ideal, maybe not how it should be, but it is the way it is. Um and I'll turn to you first, Vincent, for this one as a government employee. Um, what policies or how can policymakers collaborate with local communities to better design, implement um, strategies, economic development strategies, uh, policies for livelihoods that align with cultural values and traditional knowledges? Obviously, the government has really failed at that to this point. Maybe not in the Northwest Territories, though, because it seems like you're doing some really innovative things. So I just wondered if you could speak to that in these last few minutes. Sure. Um, I think 
kind of like how when I first started it is the idea that the government needs to recognize what all of their policies are. Um, and it's one of those things where we have systems and systems and systems of overlapping policies that and rules and and things like we are fiscal year ends on March 31st. Hunting season up here for many of our communities runs for, well, sort of the spring, one of the harvesting seasons runs from the end of February to through the end of April. We try, we're, our unit tries to help fund that. And we have to be like, well, no, you have to do your activity before the 31st of March or after the 1st of April. Doesn't make sense. Right? How can we? Like, you just you're like, and I mean, and it's one of those things where I'm like, and nobody knows, nobody knows exactly what they can what because of the weather. So you're sort of stuck there, being like, what do you do with this, right? Um, and I think that is really, I mean, that's the perfect example is understanding your full system of policies and procedures and other things that you have built in there, and then really, really genuinely asking the question is. Are we doing this just because this is the way Western people have always done it? Or are we doing it because it serves some fundamental purpose? And I think when you ask that question, you will find so many of the things that we do, we do because other Western governments do it. We do because that's the way it's always been done. Or, and not for a really big thing. And I think this is how the change comes is we put situations and we put um, programs and other things in place and do the work that we can on the ground at different levels to make those policies no longer tenable. They can no longer, there's no good argument for them existing anymore. And then we have to change. Um, realistically, I think uh, Renell was sort of saying, can we ever decolonize? No, I agree with that answer. Um, and the process of colonization was 500 years and the process of decolonization to get back to wherever we are is going to be 500 years or longer. Um, we're at the start of an interesting process in that. And so I, I hope that the work can continue to be done, but I don't know where or how to move forward other than really thinking hard about everything you do and looking at those overlapping policies because those are the ones that get us right it's the idea that oh yeah you can build you can build this cabin here but is it up to fire coat right and then and then somebody in the fire goes and does and then it's like this circular system and we don't change until we sort of say hey we need to change yeah i think that's Thank you so much, Vincent, for that. Um, with our last couple minutes, I just want to open it up to both of you. If there's any last words you want to say on this topic, I know that's not much time, but if all the thoughts that you've had over this past 90 minutes or so, if you could distill it down to sort of a, a simple phrase or two, if you like, um, in terms of moving forward from this, those of us watching in the audience who some of this, this might be brand new to some folks, some may be very well aware of these issues, um, Vincent, you've just lined up sort of what government really needs to be doing. Um, is there any last words you want to say in general on this topic today? And I'll go to you, Renelle, first. Time is a, a colonized way of thinking. Time in itself already today, we have so much teaching and knowledge to share, and we're cutting it short. That speaks for itself. Back in the day, we didn't have a time. We had the sun, we had the daytime we worked with. And that's the, even this is the lesson itself. If people were, if people would think like I think, like we think, while well, we are passionate about this, they would get in the same boat and not do ways and call it, do things in a colonized way. And it goes back to a lot, again, the years, like for us, people before us. And to add on to Vincent and this question to top it off, I know we're in time straight now, is speaking for our North, where we are in Saskatchewan, and the way I've had the experiences of 
being south and my travels and meeting people and being home is like something always just brings you home you always want to help your people and I always come home and I always think to myself like oh I wish we had an archive building if government wanted to help our people sustain our people into your question I wish there was funding in that term to get us our archive in our own community because there's tourism always terms tourism has been brought up like for a few years and I always think like we're not one to be toured this is our livelihood we're not people that you can pay and come and look at our lives how we live like this is who we are and but archives um we have a we had a we had a person who was not from Alash, but lived there for many years had a business and community for 30 years I believe he retired now and I'm sorry if I'm speaking fast I know there's time and he started a Facebook archive of our community documenting all these important things I'm like oh my god I wish this was in a building and I say that because we have a band membership of over 2,000 people Lalash alone has more than 2,000 people all of them don't live in Lalash all of them don't live here We're, we come from other places we extend across the country end of the day people want to come to come home and know who they are what your language sounds like what did that elder say in that language like they can you know how you can come in museums you could see pictures items um voices that's needs to be here in our home community because people want to come home and know their history who's the, who they who they are and i think that's what uh, the big piece will help us is archiving your own community have it safe here well kept and that's where it starts, I would believe. And of course, the funding for elders. And I shared this before we started today is I sit on the school community council board, board at the elementary and high school. And we have no funding for elders in the school. That in itself, our principal had shared that it, it affects the student body, just like it affects in a home. Ten years ago, my, when my haba passed away, it still affects me today. So I, I can feel my daughter in that school, um, as same as other students, is not having an elder present. That's a huge, huge gap already. Like there's a lot of teachings that are missed out there. I speak with my hands, <laughs> sorry. But there's a huge piece that's being missed out there because there's no funding. It's like, well, like I just, so I'm, we're working to see if we can, what, how we can fix that. But I don't, I want to re re reiterate my other answer is that I'm not trying to sound negative. We do a whole lot in our community already as well. We do a lot, education programs, there's trainings, there's people teaching our own people. Myself, we were the first class of a Dene teacher education program, first university in our reserve school. That's history right there. And like there's 21 of us that started. The 19th day in the communities, I'm myself and another student went off to BC in Alberta and it shows in itself we can sustain our own people. It stays within us, right? And I'll leave it with, again, Vincent, your history. I love hearing stories. I love, like, as a teacher, I love listening to people. Everyone teaches me something I, I leave them with. And I'll leave them, you guys, with, this is a family trait of my daughter. She's here. Well, where is she? This is my side. This is her dad's side. It's not done. This took me 13 years to put together maybe 14. I was searching for the last piece for eight years until my relative found it. And she shared. And this is our people. This goes back to 1832. Our people are not gone. And that's why I love teaching the culture humility training, because it's the history in a nutshell. It's me. It's people like us. We're, we're here. Like our stories are the one, are the, our strengths to our people, our own people. Each and every one of us carry a story. We have a strength. We have a challenge. But, and we still somehow continue on to keep our livelihood. I, I'm still trying to figure it out, like, wow, like, what keeps us going? How did my grandpa live till he was 75? How did my grandma live till she was 80? How does my grandpa live now? He's 88 years old and he's a trapper. He's 88 years old and he's a trapper. So all of your questions hit home, but I also reflect on a lot of it. Like, it's all in the food. And when Robert was sharing about the dead animals, like, oh my God, that's so sad. Like, how would, what would we do? You can't eat everything in the grocery store. You can't eat that. So what would we do? Yeah. So I'll leave you with that. I really appreciate it. Merci, Nesta. Thank you for today. Let me speak and share today. I appreciate your words so much. And I know you're right. I mean, 
we could talk all day and I'm tempted to just be like, let's let this run. <laughs> let's let it go. Um, so I don't know how Kyle would feel about that and all the folks who joined us today. And unfortunately, we're all kind of locked in this, locked in our schedules and my eyes just keep going down to the time all the time, right? All day long. When's my next meeting? When's my next you know thing? When's that due? When's this due? Um, and it's a bit of a treadmill and and having this time and space today to, to challenge that is good for all of us, I think. Um, so thank you for making that point too and for all of the, the wonderful um, and very thought provoking wisdom that you brought to us today. Thank you, Renell. And Vincent, if there's any last thing you wanna say, Speak oh, now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> it was just funny. My phone just binged at me because I literally, as Rennell was saying that, I was um, trying to just reorganize my next meeting and the person I asked to help me out with that. They're not going to it either. So I'm like, oh, no, I've got to go. Um, but I think I, think I want to reiterate a lot of what Rennell was, or not reiterate, but really that's such that time we do it to ourselves and that is like the amazing power of the western world um is probably in our timekeeping right i mean you look at the names that we call days of the week even the fact that we have days of the week right um our school calendar right i mean even if you were to conceptualize an indigenous education system in each area, yet you may end up with some older person in, in front of a room with a bunch of youth in there, whether they're all the same age or not, or whatever that looks like. But I can almost guarantee you, dollar for dollar, that it would not run from September to June, even though we use those days, right? What what it ultimately, and I mean, even if it did end up running from September to June, the reasoning and the thoughts and the values behind the decision to do that would not be the same as ours. And so how that's transmitted and all of that goes is so different. And I think that's one of the hugest parts is conceptualizing that imagining, imagining a world where if Indigenous people had created it for themselves in this area, and we just happen to come along today, rather than 500 years ago and we're just bumping into each other and saying hello for the first time what would it look like all right even if so we did trading and so they had access to all the technology we have but it's just a different world and then how do we create i think it's the idea of creating the space that our indigenous friends can create that world for themselves without us continuing to interfere and continually to make statements and other things that interfere on top of that. Um, and I don't think it's an easy thing to do and we're stuck, right? I'm stuck as a government employee. I have to make a statement at the beginning to say that this doesn't reflect the views of the government because it, it can't. And we're, I get stuck with policies that I need to follow. Right, I have my family to feed, and if I break too many policies, I don't have a job to do that. <laughs> so how do I, how do I make change without wrecking stuff? And I think we're always stuck in those sorts of situations. But I'd love to give Renelle a last word before we go, if she has anything else. I'm honored. Um, how do we say it? Sabayla. It's not for me. I appreciate it, but it's not for me. And when Kristen reached out, I'm like, the North, what? <laughs> um, it's exciting because as a teacher, I can be in a classroom like you, teaching that colonized way from September to June, just like you. But we're repeating history and it's off right there, residential schools. So it's like, why? Why would we do that? We repeat history. And that history part there, I'm going to go back to university. And again, it's like, um, 
we talk about a long time ago, but it's not a long time ago. And this is what I, one thing I always share in the trainings is it's not a long time ago. It's today. It's right now, this moment. So when you say the government chair you're in, I always, I thought, I told this to my dad, he's a, he's a survivor. He'll be 75 next year. And he was talking about getting his settlement and paying off debt. Why? Your debt will always be there. You're, everyone goes to death with debt. <laughs> like, enjoy it for yourself. Do the things you never want to do. Go see the places you want to see. And then government chairs, like, we limit ourselves. And I know we have, we love these building up professionally. I've got there. I've done it. Um, and I said this to Kristen last week is like, credentials take you places, but why can't our own people with their real stories like my dad my my grandpa my grandma all these people why can't they go and speak so i'm doing this for them it's not for myself it's for them it's the, for the people how do you say it i'm trying i'm trying to say in dene no hapa for everybody i'm speaking for them for the ones who never got a choice to speak for themselves like the 60 scoop survivors my mom residential school my dad my grandma, um, so it's a word, sanitarium survivor. My grandpa right now, 88 years old, is a trapper. I'll speak for them. It's not for me, and I appreciate it. And Vincent, I thank you for your work, right? In the government, you're an ally, definitely an ally. And I love the work that you do, and that's where we have to help each other is another Dene law is you could be creating something for us when it comes to government that we need. And I strongly believe that because sometimes we need to go visit our other brothers and sisters on this country to see how can you help us? What did you guys use? What did you work with? How do we make that work for our area, right? And yeah, it's not for me. Thank you. It's not, and I'm here today because it's for the people who never got to speak and for their people. It's for the people who never got to share with the world. So it was very good. We can go on and on. Like, if you want to do another one of these, <laughs> you have my contact information. Merci. Merci. Thank you so much, Renelle. I'm. What else is there to say um, other than we could go on for days and days, but I, I wanted to leave it on your words. So I'm just going to say thank you, everybody. If you want to reach out to any of us, you're all savvy. You know how to use Google and stuff so you can get in touch with us if you need to. There is another webinar coming up on the 25th of March, drawing on and building research capacity in Northern communities. Um, so if you were interested in the conversation today, there's more to come in terms of talking about um, northern northern issues. So hope to see you there or in some other way. And that we'll meet again somewhere, somehow. Thanks for being here today.